But now we want to talk about the age of the earth. Uh, creation is what it is, but the Bible says creation occurred not very long ago. And if we're going to be biblicists, we're going to have to stand on that. And did you know there is a great deal of scientific information that supports that clear biblical doctrine that creation occurred not very long ago? The young earth. Creation not very long ago. Well, you got to start with a joke, right? Well, there's some early archaeologists. He says, ah, take this granite bowl. It was dug up not far from here and dates back, I'd say, to early July. Well, where do they get the dates? Where do they get the dates? They find a rock, say, oh, 200 million years old or 3 billion years old. Where do they get that number? Where does that number come from? We'll talk about that in the next few minutes as we look at some rocks. And uh, how do you date them? How do you... How do, you, how do you make sense out of them? Let's remind ourselves that uh, evolution looks like this. This is the tree of life. This afternoon, actually, um, Dr. Nelson is going to be talking about the, the tree of life and where that comes from and all. Very important stuff. Um, this is, a, this is a, a, a wonderful time to be a Bible-believing Christian. Did I say that? <laughs> and a creationist. And yet, evolution is in the process of self-destructing and, and really morphing. Uh, I, I'm really looking forward to that lecture this afternoon. But evolution is the idea that billions of years ago, non-living chemicals got together and made a cell. And that through, through the process of mistakes being made in that reproduction process has come all of this vast array of plants and animals that we see alive today and in the fossil record. And finally, man. And if you let it go... A little bit farther, well, some men are more equal than others, I guess. <laughs> this is football season. It's also represented by the geologic column, the geologic time scale. Start at the top, and basically the fossils you run into at the surface are recent fossils. You go down farther, and it's back in time. You go farther enough, you get to the the dinosaur era and below that before that the before the dinosaurs and then way down here you get into the origin of life from non-life this as I mentioned last night doesn't really exist in nature this is not a presentation of the data this is a statement of evolutionary dogma this is propaganda right here uh, this is not a this is not what's discovered in nature uh, something very different is is really out there. Everybody would agree that evolution is unlikely. To go from fish to person, or from a frog to a prince, is a very unlikely thing to have to happen if you're waiting for beneficial mutations. But they say time is the hero of the plot. Uh, this is a very well-known evolutionist there at Harvard. He says time is the hero of the plot. It may be unlikely, but time, give it enough time, the impossible becomes possible, and the possible probable, and the probable virtually certain. One has only to wait. Time itself performs miracles. Now, as a scientist, it offends me that somebody would make a statement like this in the name of science. This is bald-faced religion, and it's not even good religion. It is just fairy tale stuff. Time is not the hero of the plot. In fact, as near as I can tell it, things are going downhill. And as, as they go downhill, the more time you got, the farther downhill you're going. But evolution goes uphill, and time is the enemy of the plot. Time is certainly not the hero. Time has become the carpet under which you sweep all the problems of evolution. And evolution has many problems. But you just sweep them under the carpet of time, and they're out of sight and you know all these problems of evolution the fossil record and the design in nature just sweep it under the carpet of time and in time anything can happen and this is this is just bad science it was mentioned this morning the difference between the data the real facts of observation and the interpretation of those facts. The facts we don't argue with. The facts are what we study too. 
It's just that we tell a different historical story about those facts. And the reason we do is because we start that observation process from a different presupposition or a different bias. If you start with a naturalistic bias and then look at the evidence, you can tell an evolutionary story about it. But if you start from a supernatural perspective, from the perspective that the Bible is true, then you look at the evidence and then you tell a creationist story about them. Like Grand Canyon. You can interpret Grand Canyon in light of what the Bible has to say and the Bible says a huge flood covered Arizona and that kind of flood would do that kind of destruction and now we see that canyon, this eroded rut a mile deep and 250 miles long and 18 miles wide and, and we interpret that as the result of the great flood of Noah's day not as the eroded remnant of the, uh, or the, the erosion of, of that the little bitty Colorado River down in the bottom. We tell a different story about the unobserved past. I think my story is better than the naturalist story. It's better science. It certainly fits the data better. But if you're choosing between the two, I think the creation is the better scientific story. As Christians, though, we need to start with what the Bible has to say. Because here we have the lab book, the record of one who did observe history. In fact, did it himself, he says. And we have the record. He told us things that we otherwise wouldn't know for sure. He wrote us and told us what happened, and so we can know. And what the Bible says, particularly about history, it talks about from Abraham to now is on the order of 4,000 years. Um, yeah, archaeology is, is imprecise, and maybe it's 6,000, but I think more like 4,000. But, uh, yeah, okay. But then from the Abraham, you go back to the flood, and that, if you look at the English Bibles, the Masoretic text, it's only about 300 years. Um, it's not very long from the flood to Abraham, but if you look at the Septuagint text, which is the text that was in use at the time of Christ and he referred to, quoted from, so the Septuagint is not irrelevant, and the, but the Septuagint has a little different numbers, and it says maybe there's about 2,000 years between the flood and Abraham, but that's not millions of years, but it is to be noted. But then if you go back from the flood to Adam, from creation to the flood, in, the, in our standard English Bibles, that's 1,656 years. It's a very precise, uh, precise set of numbers. And that's, you add them up, that's what you get. But again, if you look at the Septuagint, it's a little bit different numbers, but that adds up to about 2,000 years. So that adds up only to about 10,000 years or so from now back to the time of Adam. But if we're talking about the age of the earth, uh, the earth had already been here by the time Adam got here and how much time was there before Adam? The only thing that's left is the length of the days of creation. The Bible says you know, he was on the, created on the sixth day. Well, isn't there a chance that the word day could mean long periods of time and that there were is that where, is that where the ages go? Uh, it is true that the word day that's translated day in English is the Hebrew word yom, and that word yom can have a variety of meanings, including an indefinite period of time. So maybe these days were long periods of time, but if a word can have more than one possible meaning, the way to define what it means in this case, when you come to it in Scripture, is to go to the context and to the word usage and and see what it means here at this time. And when we do that, uh, I think Scripture defines it. In fact, the first time they is used, it's in verse 3 through 5, where in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and then he creates light. And God separates the light from the darkness. Already there was in this original created blob of something on day one. Uh, 
there was already a day-night cycle or a light-dark cycle. God created light, and it evidently was a directional source, and the earth rotating under that directional source, and so there was already a light-dark cycle, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and that's our word yom. The first time that word is used, God defines it. He defines it so we wouldn't get it wrong. He knew that we might tend to mistake that and attach great ages to it, so he defined it as the light portion of a light-dark cycle, a day-night cycle. He defined the word day, and then throughout the rest of the chapter, he uses that very same word, and, well, the first day, the second day, the third day. Actually, that word is quite common in the Old Testament. It's used over 2,000 times, and in almost every time, in almost every case, it obviously means a literal day, a solar day. Obvious, well, on day four, the sun was created, and so from then on, uh, that light-dark cycle was, was caused by the sun. And, well, every time it's used in the Old Testament, in almost every kind, time, it means a literal day. Now, sometimes... Like the day of the Lord. Uh, could that mean a period of time? Or does that mean a literal day? Uh, I, would, I would agree that there's some, there's some discussion on that. Uh, but it certainly doesn't mean the million years of the Lord. Or the billion years. It means a period of time around the, the second coming. Um, maybe it means a particular day, but whenever it's used as plural, days, it always means literal days. There is no such thing as plural indefinite periods of time. It only means a literal day, like a 40 days fast or a three days journey. It cannot mean a long period of time. It only means a literal day, a solar day. And then when it's modified by the modifiers evening and morning, as it is in Genesis chapter 1, the evening and the morning were the first day, the second day, the third day. It can only mean a literal day. There's no such thing as an evening of an age. Doesn't work. Genesis 1 is communicating that this was a literal day. And then whenever it's uh, used with a number modifying it, day 1, day 2, first day, second day, that only means a literal day, or a 40 days, or, or you know, it only mean it can only mean a literal day. It does not, it's not, there's no precedent for using the word and a number to mean a period of time. It only means a literal day. I think the weight of the evidence is that the word day means a literal day, that there were six days of creation. And then to nail the lid on the coffin in the book of Exodus, the very next book in the book of, of the Bible, uh, remember the people of Israel exited Egypt. That's what Exodus is all about. And he took them to Mount Sinai where he gave them some information that they might not know otherwise. And to make sure they got it, he wrote it in stone. And I'm a geologist. I like stone, so I like this passage. But... He wrote these Ten Commandments in stone so they couldn't get it wrong. And one of those Ten Commandments mentioned the concept of creation. That's the fourth commandment. And th that commandment is, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That's our word, day. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You work six days and rest one day, and then in verse 11, because... In fact, this is the only commandment for which a reason is given. This is a, a prominent one in the Ten Commandments. He says, you work six days and rest one day because, in verse 11, I work six days and rested one day. And in those six days, the Lord made, created the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything that lives in them. And he rested the seventh day. And God wrote it in stone so we wouldn't get it wrong. How dare seminary professors say it doesn't mean that? 
God is telling us that he created in six days like today. Got it? And he wrote it in stone. I think if we're going to be Bible believers, we're locked in to believe in this. So we go back to our adding up. If we add six days for creation, not six periods of time, not six billion years, what we come to is on the order of 6,000 years, or if you take the Septuagint, you might get up to uh, 10,000 years. And so sometimes you'll hear creationists answer the question, how old is the earth? We'll say six to 10,000 years. Well, that's where the numbers come from. I'm, I lean more toward the six. In fact, if you pushed me, I'd probably come down around 6,500, somewhere in there. But it's on the order of six and not on, certainly not on six million or six billion years. 6,000. In fact, one of the books we published was thousands, not billions. And you ought to be able to tell the difference between the two. <laughs> and by the way, what the Bible says, shouldn't that be enough for a Christian? If the Bible says six to 10,000 years, isn't that enough? Do you need more evidence? Shouldn't, but there is more. Actually, those, uh, some would say that the creation account and the evolution account are really telling the same story. Uh, but, you know, if you look carefully at Scripture, the order of creation is very, very different from the order of evolution. Um, they're not telling the same story at all. In fact, you could list contradictions in the, that order ad nauseum. But here are a couple of my favorite. The poster boy for evolution these days is the idea of that whales evolved from land animals. They make a big deal about this. This is always a major exhibit in the museum that whales came from some sort of a land animal. Maybe it was a cow-like animal or maybe a wolf-like animal. Or now they're talking different ones, hippopotamus or something. Uh, but a land animal evolved into a whale. The idea behind evolution is that life evolved in the sea and then it evolved eventually into fish and that sooner or later one fish you know one fish type grew legs and walked out on land as an amphibian then amphibians became reptiles and reptiles became mammals and some mammals then turned around went back into the sea and became whales many millions of years involved between fish and whales um, and it was a wolf-like ancestor that they, they primarily think. Well, we could talk about that, but uh, evolution says that land animals like wolves or cow or hippopotamus came before whales. But the Bible says, the Creator tells us that on day five, God made the animals that lived in the sea, that swim in the sea. And on day six, God made the animals that walked on land. And that's what the Creator t says. And in other words, whales came before land animals. Just backwards. And then the one that they use most of all nowadays is that dinosaurs evolved into birds. In fact, birds are dinosaurs, according to some of them. And, um, but again, dinosaurs were land animals. They were created on day six, and birds were flying animals that were created on day five. According to evolution, dinosaurs came before birds, but according to the creator, birds came before dinosaurs. Take it to the bank. Evolution is not taught in Scripture. Creation is taught in Scripture. Creation in six days. But they say they're not true. They've still got to salvage these, the millions of years and put it in the Bible somewhere. So they say, yeah, the order of creation is all wrong, but maybe the the days overlap and some parts of day six came before some parts of day three this is the chart I got out of Dr. Hugh Ross's book where he overlaps the days and you see some part of some parts of day six came before some parts of day three because according to evolution the land animals were already here before the flowering plants got here so he 
his view is predicated on what evolution says, not on what the Bible says. But it gets worse than this. Um, uh, Dr. Davis Young at Calvin College, he does this to the six days of creation. Now, as a Bible believer, this churns my stomach. This just makes me want to weep that a Christian brother would do this to Scripture. The Bible says false teachers twist Scripture and make it say things that it doesn't say. And that's what's going on in many of our seminaries and Bible colleges. No wonder our church is so weak that we're, we're taught not to believe and apply the Scriptures by our seminary professors. We've got a lot of work to do. There's a lot of work to do. Let's get at it. Let's get to work. This state of things has been prophesied from long ago. In fact, in 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter, one of the disciples, uh, after Christ had died, he, he was a minister to the, the Jewish people. And, and as he wrote to the, to the Jews in Rome, he says, he says about the last days. He's talking about the last day. This is the last chapter that Peter wrote. He says, I want you to understand this, first of all, that they'll come in the last days, scoffers, and there certainly are a lot of scoffers around in these last days. They're walking after their own lust. And he says, this is what the scoffers say. They say, ah, man, where is this? the promise of his coming? He promised to come back. He's been gone a long time. He's not coming back. You can just hear that scoffing tone in, in what they say. They say that for since the fathers fell asleep from time immemorial, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Uh, this phrase, all things continue, I don't know if you recognize it or not, but that's a layman's definition of the concept of uniformity, which dominates our university systems right now. All things continue. Present processes, like we see happening today, is all that there's ever been, and these processes created the the universe and, and the solar system and the earth and life and higher forms of life from lower forms of life, all by present processes of mutation and natural selection. Present processes, all things continue. Peter goes on to say in the next verse, it says, For this, these, these scoffers, their creed, they are willingly ignorant of certain things that not by natural processes like we see today, but by supernatural processes, by the Word of God. The heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. This is a reference back to the original created state of things. That they're willingly ignorant of creation and the flood, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. They are willingly ignorant of creation and the flood. They see the evidence. They choose not to believe it. We can rub their faces in it, and they don't see it. In fact, I had a professor in graduate school. I was talking with him one day, and he says, um, he says, even if creation is true, even if you find the Ark of Noah, even if you find that boat and you take me over there and you rub my face right into the side of Noah's Ark, I won't see it because it did not exist. Friends, that's willing ignorance. And that's the kind of people that we pay to teach our children. What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> Got it? Uniformity explains Grand Canyon, so they say. Uh, not, that's, that's not Grand Canyon. That's the Niagara Gorge at Niagara Falls. Uh, and this is the Niagara River coming down, and it, there's two sets of falls, the Canadian Falls, the American Falls, separated by Goat Island. But uh, as this falls comes over, it carves out a, a gorge, and this gorge goes all the way down to Lake Ontario. It goes from Lake Erie to Lake Ontario, and this gorge is several miles long. And the Canadian Falls here, as this erodes back and it's lengthening that gorge. The gorge is a canyon that goes on down and that canyon is about seven miles long. Um, it's 
eroding backward at about five feet per year on average. Well, now they stabilize it somewhat. It, it doesn't do that anymore. But it, it, in history, had gone back five feet per year, which if you divide into the seven miles, that gets you up just a few thousand years. Well, Charles Lyell came and visited this site, and he assumed that it, that it was eroding back just small little bitty things, just small increments. And he said maybe one foot per year, even though the locals were saying, no, it's five feet per year, we see it happening, it's taken my farm. And he said, no, it's just one foot per year. And, it, and he estimated that it took 35,000 years to carve this one little gorge. This proved that the Bible was wrong. This little picture right here. This proves that the Bible's wrong. Well, it was Lyell that was wrong. He made a wrong measurement and applied uniformity and came to a wrong answer. Uniformity is applied in lots of ways. Biological uniformity, that's evolution. Astronomic uniformity, that's the Big Bang. And then there's geologic uniformity, that's the millions of years of, of rocks. And since I'm a rock guy, I'm going to talk about geology here for the next few minutes. Geology assumes that present processes have continued for billions of years throughout history, and they base that primarily on radioisotope dating. Well, radioisotope dating is not really too mysterious. Some atoms are radioactive, right? Uranium is radioactive. And as that gives off radiation, it actually decreases the mass of the atom. A uranium atom will actually split off an alpha particle, which is a helium atom, actually. And then that uranium atom actually changes into a lead atom. It's smaller. It's giving off little particles along the way. And um, that radioactive uh, atom, um, hmm. when they find a rock that has some uranium in it, they measure how much uranium is in it and how much lead is in it, and they've, they've measured the rate at which uranium changes into lead, so they can estimate how long did it take for that much lead to be produced by that much uranium, and that's thought to be the age of the rock. So, how do you date a rock? That's how they do it. Precise measurements, accurate calculations, but did they interpret those calculations correctly? That's a tough job. Let me illustrate you, illustrate that with a parable. Uh, this is the parable of the potato bucket. Suppose as you came in from the break a minute ago, I was already up here with a table, and, and I had a bushel basket of potatoes, and you sat down to see what would happen, and you noticed that I reached in the bucket, peeled it, picked out a potato, peeled it, put it back in. And then you notice that every time the second hand got up to 12 on the clock, I reached in, peeled, picked out a potato, peeled it, and put it back in. And I did that every minute for about 10 minutes. And finally, you ask the all-important question, how long has this nut been doing that? That's the same question as how old is this rock? How long has this process been going on? Well, how would you answer that question? What would you do to, how long have I been doing that? What would you do? Ah, you'd come up and you'd count the potatoes and you'd come up and there's 25 peeled potatoes in there. How long have I been doing that? 25 minutes, well, maybe. You've made some assumptions about the past. And if your assumptions are correct, then you've got the right answer. But if your assumptions are wrong, well, then maybe not. You made the assumption primarily that the rate of potato peeling has been constant. That throughout all of history, I've been peeling potatoes at one per minute. But you men, you know that a man cannot peel a potato in one minute. <laughs> that is impossible, but maybe you could get good enough at it to do it. Your wife does it. Maybe a man could develop the ability to peel a potato in a minute. And maybe I've been maybe I can do that now. Maybe you've been seeing me after a lot of practice. Maybe I've been slower in the past, or maybe I was faster and I'm getting tired. You don't know 
the rate in the past. You've made an assumption about the rate in the past. You've also made the assumption that nobody has come in here and tampered with all my potatoes. Maybe somebody has come in and dumped a bunch of peeled potatoes in my basket. And so some of those peeled potatoes got here not through the potato peeling process. If so, it's messed up your calculations. Or maybe somebody's come in here and eaten one of those potatoes. Yeah, the IRS is always taking your hard-earned, the, the fruit of your hard-earned labors. But you've also made the assumption that when I started the process, there were only unpeeled potatoes in my basket and no peeled potatoes. But if I started with some peeled potatoes, it already looked old when it wasn't even started yet. So you see all these assumptions that you've had to make, and you've got to get them right about the unobserved past in order to get your calculation right. Same assumptions with radioisotope dating. The rate of radioactive decay, the closed system, the, the original starting conditions. And original starting conditions, uh, there's a, that's a good one. That, that's a good one. Because sometimes rocks are found that seem to already have the radioactive daughter products, the lead, and as well as uranium. And so it already looks old when it was just started. In fact, here's Grand Canyon. Oh, this is a schematic view of Grand Canyon. The way evolutionists think about Grand Canyon rocks is that but these rocks down here in the center, those are, you know, on the order of two billion years old. Huh. But then these tilted rocks over here in the side, those are on the order of one billion years old. And then there was an event happened that just scoured them off to a completely flat surface. And then rocks were put on top of them. And that happened on the order of 550 million years ago. And then the rocks continued to accumulate up to uh, on the order of 250 million years ago. And then the, these are all ocean bottom rocks, by the way, ocean bottom rocks with ocean bottom fossils. But then the whole thing was lifted up out of the ocean and erosion was allowed to occur. And that's within the last 70 million years when the canyon itself was formed. And then, but there have been some recent volcanoes up at the top. There are Indian artifacts in these volcanics, and so we know that they're historic and they're just in the last thousand years or so. That's the present world. So this is how evolutionists look at Grand Canyon. Well, creationists see the very same canyon. We see the very same rocks, but yet we tell a different story about their history. We say that these rocks down here at the bottom are very likely creation rock. In the beginning, God created the earth. And then there were some processes going on early after creation and before the flood and early in the flood, uh, early flood deposition and tilting. And then the flood came and whoosh, scoured it off to a completely smooth um, area. And then some early flood deposition right here uh, at this level. And then throughout the flood year, there were more deposits. And then midway through the flood, those ones up at the top. And then late in the flood, the, the canyon, the whole continent was lifted up out of the ocean and erosion could begin to occur. And so late in the flood and after the flood, uplift and erosion. So that's how a creationist would look at the at Grand Canyon. And then of course there were some recent volcanoes. We agree with the evolutionist on those recent volcanoes. Because there's Indian artifacts in the, in the lavas. Okay? Well, there are only a few of those rocks that can be dated with radioisotope techniques. The sedimentary rocks, limestone, shale, sandstone, those cannot be dated by any technique. They are undateable with radioisotope dating. Igneous rocks like lava and granite, those kinds of rocks, rocks that used to be in a hot molten condition can be dated theoretically. And there are a couple, the, the, the technique that's accepted for use for these rocks on here, there's the Cardenas basalts. That one technically, or theoretically, can be dated. And also these lavas up here with Indian artifacts in them. 
that's the kind of lava rock that can be dated. And these rocks down here at the bottom, those do date with rubidium strontium isochron technique at 1.1 billion years old. That's, that's what they come up with. But using that very same technique, the very same technique, it's a very similar type of rock, the basalts up at the top with Indian artifacts in them, those date at 1.3 billion years old. The obviously recent rocks date older than the older rocks. This can't be. This can't be. But this is a very typical scenario. Uh, in fact, Mount St. Helens, right down the road here, that thing erupted in 1980 in since. And so those rocks are less than 30 years old, right? They date 2.4 million years old. They started out old, sorta. Well, looking old. But volcanics all around the world, we've, we've cataloged these things. Uh, people have dated them and we've dated them. Uh, Hawaiian basalt, so there's Mount Etna. These things all erupted in historic times. We know the day they erupted. We know the day the rock was formed. But every time that kind of rock is dated, every time, Underline every in your mind. Every time a, a historic rock is dated, a rock for which we know the date precisely, it's a human history rock. Every time that rock dates millions of years. The method gives a wrong answer. Every time. Every time. Well, there's more. I, I, we could list a lot of these. Uh, there's Hawaiian ones. There's European. I mean, every time historic rocks are dated, it comes back millions of years. Every time. Here's some more. Every time a, a historic lava flow is dated, it always comes back millions of years. Every time we can check it, it doesn't work. Does this give you any confidence that it's going to work when you can't check it? The method doesn't work. The equations are right. The, the measurements are correct. But the assumptions under which they're, they're evaluated are wrong. Uniformity is wrong. Well, to me, the key issue is the great flood of Noah's day. Talk about a non-uniform event. The whole earth was restructured by that great flood of Noah's day. The Bible says it was a year-long, mountain-covering, worldwide deluge and it altered the entire earth. It covered Arizona, it covered Washington, it covered the whole earth, and, it, and it, its damage is obvious everywhere you look. The main issue, as we talked last night, is the fossils. When did those fossils die? Did they die millions of years ago? Evolution says they did death and extinction for millions and millions of years. But the Bible says that when things were created, they were created to last forever. But that creation rejected God's authority. And that rejection, rebellion is sin, and the wages of sin is what? And there are some dead things. Now, fossils don't sin. People sin, and Adam's sin ruined all of God's very good creation. And we're living in that cursed, dying remnant of a once very good creation. Trying to figure out its history. The key to figuring out Earth history, I'm convinced, is the great flood of Noah's day. If Noah's flood happened, its results would include vast deposits of sediments containing extensive fossil remains of plant and animal life. If you ask an evolutionist, where's the evidence for great ages? They say, well, it's in the rocks and fossils. In the rocks, that's where we find evidence of millions of years. In the fossils, that's where we find evidence of evolution. But if Noah's flood really happened, it laid down the rocks and the fossils, and evolution's got it wrong. If evolution tries to use rocks and fossils, they've got a wrong assumption. They are assuming uniformity, 
and biblically that is a false view I think there's another interpretation that's the great flood if the flood made the rocks and the fossils there were no geologic ages the great flood of Noah's day employed primarily the fountains of the great deep and the windows of heaven Genesis 7 11 but if that kind of flood happened we would expect to find evidence of that we would expect to find catastrophic deposition of rocks and fossils not slow and gradual uniformitarian type deposits and we would expect to find those deposits acting on a or having acted on a regional or continental scope not a local scope not a riverbank but a continent I mean, not a beachfront, but a continent or a hemisphere because it was global in scope. Well, as is common for creation speakers and, and for this seminar, I'm already running over. No, I'm not running over yet. According to the schedule, it's long over. But um, turbidites, major underwater deposits formed by catastrophic currents, we know these happen today sometimes. One that happened back in the 1920s uh, was a catastrophic. It was going out at 60 miles an hour, and it went out for 430 miles. It covered 40,000 square miles with a deposit in just a very short period of time. Turbidites are now recognized on the continents as the majority of the rocks on the continents are what we call turbidites. And, and related type catastrophic deposits, uh, underwater gravity flows and stuff. There are some rocks you might even recognize. These are in Mount St. Helens. These were formed in one afternoon just by just major catastrophic flows, uh, uh, 60 miles an hour, 90 miles an hour, just whoosh, and there was a layer of rock. That's one layer, that's a 40 mile an hour zone, that's a 90 mile an hour zone. There's a person for scale. Those happen just instantaneously. I think that's the kind of thing that was happening at, at the Great Flood of Noah's day. These things would have a lot of internal layering that uh, uh, happened quickly, not over long periods of time. They look just like the rocks at Grand Canyon. I think those were laid down rapidly too. My favorite rock at Grand Canyon is this lower, lowest level of horizontally bedded strata. It's called the Tapete Sandstone. It covers the whole area. I mean, it covers a wide area from one end of the canyon to the other. But even though evolutionists used to say that this was a uniformitarian deposit, just slow and gradual accumulation of sand at the bottom of the ocean, the more they've studied it, they say, no, no, this is really a, an underwater mud flow just an underwater gravity flow of, of sediments, of sandy sediments that covered this area. And um, this mud flow was flowing through here at 90 miles an hour. That's what the evolutionists are saying nowadays. They're saying this was a catastrophic deposit. A 90 mile an hour mud flow. Usually it's horizontal, but some places it's vertical. Interesting. Um, I'll show you where this is. You come with me to Grand Canyon. This is hard to get to, but this is over on the edge of the canyon. But the way you understand it, here's the canyon with flat-lying strata. These same rocks are in northeastern Arizona are the same rocks over in northwestern Arizona. This is eastern Arizona, a couple hundred miles away. Same rocks, but they're about a mile lower in elevation. And this was accomplished by some major faulting down inside. Um, they say that faulting took place 70 million years ago. But th this rock, my Tapete Sandstone, that's dated at about 550 million years old. And so, if you do the math, this rock was already 480 million years old at the time of uplift. How long does it take to have a sandy sediment harden into a sandstone? might take a few years, but it's not going to take a million years, certainly not 
480 million years, it ought to have been a hard rock. Well, we can go to the hinge point right here and look and see, was this hard at the time it bent or maybe it was soft? Well, let's go and look. And sure enough, there's that vertical rock and there's the horizontal rock and it's bent in a 90 degree angle. There's some people for scale. I ask you, was that mud soft when it bent or was it hard? If it was hard, it'd have broken. Was it peanut brittle or was it saltwater taffy? This one picture wipes out 480 million years of hokey pokey history. It just didn't happen. The world is full of things like that. Oh, there's the Grand Canyon. Oh, I love Grand Canyon. There's the Tapeat Sandstone again. Like I say, the catastrophic deposition is underwater mud flows. But it was on a regional scale. That one Tapeat Sandstone, by the way, not only is it northern and eastern and western Arizona, but it's also up in Utah. And it's also up in Nevada. And it's also up in Idaho. And it's also in Montana. It's in Illinois. It's in Pennsylvania. It's in, it's in Canada. It's in Greenland. It's, where, it's over in Europe. That one layer of rock, if you were to map it, well, that one layer of rock that was deposited at 90 miles an hour covers the bulk of North America and more. If this was a 90 mile an hour mud flow, this was a catastrophe beyond our experience, certainly a non-uniform event. What kind of a catastrophe are we talking about here? I think it was the great flood of Noah's day. Well, time to quit. Oh, there was some nice pictures in there. I'm not going to show you put my sword away here but that's the point of this whole conference is that guys the Bible is right and we can trust it it trusts that when it talks about rocks and fossils it talks about the the philosophies that are swirling around in the latter days the Bible is right and we can trust it we can trust it not only with our science and history we can trust it with our kids with our checkbook with our eternal destiny with the promise that Christ gave us that he's gone to prepare a place for us we can believe it because well like he told Nicodemus he says if I've told you about earthly things and you don't believe me how can you believe me when I tell you about heavenly things because we see that his word was so accurate when it talks about earthly things things that we can check we have great faith to believe it even in those areas that we can't check and we do God is good well, thank you for coming. I think this is my last lecture. Thanks for your fellowship, for your testimony. God bless you in the days ahead.